Good morning, Sun Belief. Welcome to our online service. Happy Sabbath, friends, and welcome to Sun Belief Church online service. Welcome, church family. Welcome, Sun Belief members. So, be strong and of good courage. Welcome to the Lord. And finally, number three, trust in the Lord. God is promising. of Revelation, while in isolation, the Apostle John greets the seven churches in Asia Minor and has a message for them. So if it was good for the churches then, when John was under lockdown, it's good for the churches today whilst we are in lockdown. And so I greet all three churches on the campus of Helderberg College, Silverleaf Church, Helderberg Church, and all nations church. I greet you all in the name of our reigning, redeeming, and soon returning Saviour, Jesus Christ. Our message for today comes from the words of Jesus. It can be found in Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 to 39. Jesus is speaking here concerning his second coming and soon return. Matthew says that Jesus says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. May the Lord bless the time that we spend together in his holy word. I have elected to entitle the message, A Name Like No Other. Today is the Sabbath day, a commemoration and a celebration of creation. We remember God, who on day one called light out of darkness. He named the light day, and he named the darkness night. And so on this day, This sanctified day, a commemoration and a celebration of creation, we remember God, who on day two separated the waters which were above from the waters that were below, and in so doing created the blue skies. He named the sky heaven. And so on this day, this set-aside day, a commemoration and a celebration of creation, we remember God, who on day three, gathered the waters together and allowed the land to appear. He named the land earth and the waters he named seas. On that same day, God carpeted the earth with green grass and he decorated the green grass with flourishing flowers. He raised towering trees which were dressed up with fruits of every size, shape and colour. And so on this day, this sacred day, a commemoration and a celebration of creation, we remember God who on day four hung the sun, the moon, and the stars in their place. These were to designate and demarcate times and seasons. And so Genesis chapter 1 verse 14 records, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And so on this day, this seventh day, a commemoration and a celebration of creation, we remember God, who on day five filled the sky with birds and saturated the seas with fish. And on this day, this special day, a commemoration and a celebration of creation, we remember God, who on day six created all things bright and beautiful and all creatures great and small. And on that very same day, our omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent God knelt down in the dust. Everything else he had called into existence. But now, now our creator God forms and fashions man in his own image, with his own hands and in his own likeness. And so you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Then God proceeded to give man the very first kiss. It was the breath 
of life. And so on this day, this special seventh day, this sacred, set-aside, sanctified Sabbath day, a commemoration and a celebration of creation, we remember God who created everything and saw that everything was good. In fact, this refrain of God seeing and then pronouncing that it was good is repeated in Genesis chapter 1 seven times. The number seven symbolizing and signifying perfection. And so it is recorded in Genesis chapter 1 verse 4, and God saw the light that it was good. Then in verse 10, and God saw that it was good. Then in verse 12, and God saw that it was good. Then in verse 18, and God saw that it was good. Then in verse 21, and God saw that it was good. Then in verse 25, and God saw that it was good. Six times in Genesis chapter 1, God sees his creation and his conclusion is that it was good. Then in Genesis chapter 1 verse 31, the very last verse of the very first chapter of the Bible, the climax and the culmination of creation, it is recorded. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And so on this day, on this occasion, even in isolation, it is a commemoration and a celebration of creation. We remember God how he created everything, and how he saw and said that it was good. However, five chapters following on from this positive declaration, things had drastically and dramatically changed. Man no longer remembered God. Take your Bibles and turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. There it reports, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Amidst the iniquity and infidelity and idolatry and immorality that was present and prevalent at that time was a man who remained faithful to God. His name was Enoch. The Bible tells us that Enoch was the seventh from Adam. Through holy angels, God revealed to Enoch his purpose to destroy the world by a flood. And he also opened more fully to him the plan of redemption. By the spirit of prophecy, he carried him down through the generations that should live after the flood and showed him the great events connected with the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. And so this holy man of God, this prophet, At the age of 65, Enoch and his wife had a baby boy. They named him Methuselah. You must understand that those days were very different to nowadays. Whilst today at age 65, you'd be expected to retire. At age 65 then, you were at the very beginning of your life. They did not count nor measure the span of a person's life in decades, but in centuries. Just look at Adam, who was 930 when he died. Or Adam's son, Seth, who was 912 when he died. Or Seth's son, Enos, who was 905 when he died. Or Enos's son, Cainan, who was 910 when he died. Or Cainan's son, Mahalalil, who was 895 when he died. Or Mahalalil's son, Jared, who was 962 when he died. Now many people confuse Enoch with his son, Methuselah. For it is often said that Methuselah was the oldest man to ever live, but this is not quite correct. The fact is, Methuselah was the oldest man to ever die. He died at age 969. Enoch was the oldest man to ever live, for he still lives today. But don't take my word for it. Go to the word of God. Genesis chapter 5 verse 24 reports, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not. For God took him. And so we have this assurance that if we walk with God here and now, that we will be able to walk with God there and then. We will walk on streets of gold. We'll run and never get weary. We'll eat from a tree that bears 12 different kinds of fruit. And we'll watch 
as the lion and the lamb play together. But if you want to experience that existence, you need to learn to walk with God now, constantly and consistently and continually. You need to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. Enoch loved the Lord. And so at the age of 65, Enoch had a son. Like any parent, Enoch was careful in choosing the right name for his child. He wanted to give his baby boy a name like no other. And so remembering the prophecy that he had been granted and gifted by God to see, Enoch named his son Methuselah. The first part of his name, Methu, meaning death. The second part of his name, Selah meaning it shall come. This was a name like no other, for his name meant when he dies, it shall come. This was a name like no other, for this name was prophetic. Methuselah, when he dies, it shall come. When he dies, God shall send it. Methuselah would live a life longer than any other person who would die. His name would be a warning to a wicked world that when he dies, probation would be closed. At his death, God would send judgment by way of a worldwide flood. Understand that towards the end of Methuselah's life, his grandson Noah would preach for 120 years, but God, in his mercy, gave this warning to this world long before. Noah preached for 120 years. Noah was the son of Lamech, who lived for 777 years. Lamech was the son of Methuselah, who lived for 969 years. Methuselah was the son of Enoch. Can you remember how old Enoch was when Methuselah was born? He was 65. And at age 65, Enoch began preaching to the world, warning them of the flood. Enoch preached for 300 years. Enoch not only received prophetic visions from God, but he preached the word of God. We gain greater insight to Enoch's prophetic ministry in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 57. It says this, Enoch continued to grow more heavenly while communing with God. His face was radiant with a holy light which would remain upon his countenance while instructing those who would hear his words of wisdom. His heavenly and dignified appearance struck the people with awe. And so at age 65, Enoch had Methuselah, and then he preached for 300 years. And now at age 365, Enoch was taken to heaven, a witness to those wicked people that if they would amend their ways, if they would remember their creator, if they would repent of their sins, if they would return to God, that they would receive a reward of eternal life. And so as Enoch's son Methuselah grew, he was aware that he had a name like no other. It was distinct in nature. Methuselah not only preached to the people, but his name was a sermon in itself. When I die, the flood will come. Methuselah's life was so long that for the last 243 years of Adam's life, he was alive. And for the first 600 years of Noah's life, he was alive. Methuselah would have spoken to both Adam and Noah. Can you imagine Methuselah taking his grandson Noah on his lap and telling him stories that he was told by his own great, 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 great grandfather Adam. This man who had conversed with God face to face. This man who had lived in a world which had not been touched nor tainted with sin. This man who had seen creation in its very first week and who had lived in the Garden of Eden and who had been clothed with God's righteous light. Can you see the smile on Methuselah's face as he remembers how it was in the beginning? But that smile soon turns to a frown as he witnesses the wickedness in the sin-sick world that he now lives in, and he remembers his name. In the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 92, paragraph 2, we discover that Methuselah helped Noah to build the ark. And so as the people heard Noah preaching, they saw the old man working. Who's that? 
some may have said. That's Methuselah. The reply would have been, that's a strange name. What does it mean? It means when he dies, it shall come. And so this old man, Methuselah, must, must have now had his hair white, his eyes dim, his back bowed together. All these were signs being fulfilled that God's judgment was near. Methuselah's health would have declined. He would no longer walk with a spring in his step and the people would have known that their time was short. God gave Noah the message that he was growing weary of sin, that the flood would come, and that their only means of salvation would be in the ark. And so Noah preached, and Methuselah aged, but the people did not hearken to God's word. That is why Jesus says, For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Now understand, there's nothing wrong with eating and there's nothing wrong with drinking and there's nothing wrong with getting married. The problem was, destruction was coming. But they were living their lives as if nothing was happening. Judgment was coming, but nothing changed. Salvation was offered, but they lived their lives, business as usual. You would have thought that the sight of a parade of animals marching into the ark would have been enough to affirm and confirm that God's word was true. This procession of all God's creatures paired together, making their way into that wooden vessel, seeing the giraffes with their long necks, noticing the rhinoceroses with their large and heavy bodies, viewing the birds flying down and the creepy crawlies climbing and coming up, witnessing the lion walking calmly next to the spring bock. All these were signs that they were living on borrowed time. The fact that Methuselah's life was so long testifies to the patience and the mercy of God. But what was true then is true now. For Genesis chapter 6 verse 3 says that God says, My spirit shall not always strive with man. Methuselah had a name like no other. The older he got, the shorter the time was for everyone else to be saved. Methuselah could no longer preach. He no longer had to preach, for his very name was to bring conviction. And when time was up and Methuselah died, the flood came. Take note that it had never rained before, but if God said it, you better believe it. Some of us within our church today question the spirit of prophecy but God has given this gift to his remnant people through his prophet we have been instructed that Jesus is even at the door in 1850 Mrs White wrote time can last but a very little longer in 1875 she wrote we are near the close of time in 1882 she wrote time is drawing to a close in 1889, she wrote, time is very short. And if those remarks were made over a century ago, I declare with confidence and conviction, we are living on borrowed time. Jesus warns in Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, that as the days of Noah were in the past, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be in the future. Jesus had looked into history to parallel the wickedness in Noah's day with the wickedness that we can be expecting and are experiencing today. Just as Jesus looked back to the past, Enoch looked forward into the future, both seeing that the people's carefree and careless attitude in the time of Noah would be the same before the second coming of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul describes the wickedness and the evil traits of people in these last days. Paul says this, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through to 5. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. The word of God says people living in these last days will have a form of godliness. 
They look good on the outside, but they're rotten on the inside. They're informed, but they're not transformed. What do you mean, Pastor B? I'm glad you asked. They know the truth about the seventh day Sabbath, but they're mean and impatient. They're informed, but not transformed. They understand the truths about the sanctuary doctrine, but they love to gossip and to slander. They're informed, but not transformed. They keep the principles of healthy living, but whilst they eat like a herbivore, they behave like a carnivore. They're informed, but not transformed. On Sabbath, they sing, tell me the story of Jesus. But from Sunday to Friday, their Bibles remain closed. They're informed, but not transformed. Their prayers sound so eloquent, but they're not forgiving. They sing so sweetly, but they're not interested in spiritual things. They know a lot about the Bible, but they're proud and self-righteous. They're informed, but not transformed. Paul describes these people as having a form of godliness, but their lives deny that the power of God has been working in them. Their style without substance. Simply put, if they were taken to court, put on trial and accused of being a Christian, there would not be enough evidence to convict them. This list that Paul gives of evil people living in these last days seems to be extensive and exhaustive. But when Jesus refers to the wicked people living in the days of Noah, he does not talk about who they are. He talks about what they do. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Their lives did not reflect the soon coming judgment. What about us today? Do our lives proclaim that Jesus' coming is soon? Several years before the Civil War in America, another child was born. This was not the birth of a baby boy or a baby girl, but it was the birth of a movement. They needed a name, and so the parents came together in Battle Creek. They were under the leadership of Elder Wagoner. Others, including Ellen White, were in attendance, and so they prayed to God for a name. The leading suggestion was, let's call this child the Church of God. And they debated and deliberated, but Mrs. White reminded them that other groups were already using that name and advised that their child ought to have a name like no other. Their name should carry a message that in these last days, people would know that God has a saving message for a dying world. And so they went back into session and someone suggested, let's call this child the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But during that time, around 1844, the Mormons had also come into being and they had already adopted the name, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so even though this child was the Church of God, and even though this child was the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, they needed a name like no other. These were good names but they needed a name that was distinct and distinguishable. And so they prayed more fervently. And in answer to their petitions and supplications, God spoke and, and through God's moving, they came up with the name Seventh Day Adventist. And Mrs. White exclaimed, that's it. That is the name, a name like no other, for it carries the distinctive features of our faith that cannot be applied to any other church or movement. The first part of our name, seventh day, meaning we believe that God has created all things and we believe that creation was seven literal days. And we believe in all that God has commanded, including the fourth commandment. And we believe in these last days before our Lord shall come that the Sabbath is the sign and seal of sanctification. That is the first part of our name. The second part of our name. Adventist, meaning we look forward to the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Adventist, meaning we have this hope that burns within our hearts, hope in the coming of the Lord. And so as Earth's history climaxes to its conclusion, Ellen White writes that this name, Seventh-day Adventist, would be a rebuke not only to the Catholic Church, 
but to a Protestant world. They will label you legalists. They will condemn you as a cult. They will accuse you of being under law and not under grace. But just like with the life of Methuselah, we have a name to live up to. And our very name is a sign that things are being fulfilled. And so let us not be guilty of the same sins that were evident and prevalent at the time of Noah. For as real as God's judgment with water was, is as real as God's judgment of fire will be. But just as salvation was offered then, salvation is offered now. And so Acts chapter 4 verse 12 informs us, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so just as Methuselah had a name like no other, and just as we as Seventh-day Adventists have a name like no other, there is another who has a name like no other. Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 9 says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so, my sisters and my brothers, soon and very soon, our Saviour, King Jesus, is coming again. For the Bible declares Michael will stand up, the books will be closed up, the sky will light up, the trumpet sound will go up, the heavens will be opened up, Jesus will speak up, the saints will be called up, the graves will be opened up, the dead in Christ shall rise up, and those that are alive and remain will be caught up, and you and I will be given a new name. And so we need to be ready. If you're not ready yet, you need to get ready. If you're already ready, you need to stay ready. For our name suggests that our Lord will come and he will not be slow. One hymn says, the night is almost gone. The day is coming on. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. Another hymn says, the golden morning is fast approaching. Jesus soon will come. So we need to be ready. Another hymn says, lift up the trumpet it and loud let it ring Jesus is coming again so we need to be ready another hymn says the coming king is at the door so we need to be ready and so you and I can look forward to that day for on that day it will be a commemoration and a celebration of redemption the songwriter says when we all get to heaven What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and we'll shout. I'm going to sing, redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I'm going to sing, my Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. I'm going to sing nothing between my soul and the Savior. I'm going to shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God I made it. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing. And we'll shout the victory. Is that your desire? Can we pray together? Divine and most merciful God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for being our help in the past and our hope for the future. We also thank you for your promise that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so we ask for forgiveness for the times we have misrepresented you, for the times we have lacked faith in you, and for the times we have heard your word but failed to live by it. May that all change today. Most of all, we thank you for the name that is above every other name. And we pray that when the role is called up yonder, we will all be there. Help us not only to be ready, but to get others ready and prepared for your soon return. May this all be done in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of your Holy Spirit.